We're moving on to 31C Sage Grouse Sagebrush Ecosystem Council update. Uh, Director Wosley and Commissioner Drew. I'll start and then Tony can clean up with all the stuff that I missed. But um, we had a meeting, I believe it was last Thursday, of the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council. And, and then our next meeting is coming up on uh, oh, October. I think it's the 10th and 11th, but I'll look it up on the calendar just to confirm. That's so correct. Everyone knows. 10th and 11th, it'll be a two-day meeting. The reason it's a two-day meeting is obviously we've got a lot going on, um, so I'm just going to hit the highlights. The bi-state sage grouse finding from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service should be out um, the first week in October is what we're being told. Uh, in regards to the greater sage grouse, the BLM has a programmatic EIS that is going to amend every one of their resource management plans in Nevada, um, and that's going to come out uh, in draft format uh, middle of October. Uh, there will be a state plan or a state alternative included in that. And so for anyone who's interested in sage grouse or sage grouse management, I would highly encourage you to take the time to maybe pull up and look at that um, draft. And it may be something that this commission uh, wants to take a look at and potentially provide some level of comment to as well. Um, I know the Ecosystem Council will be looking at it through the ecosystem technical team and I'm hoping the department's comments will also be incorporated into that. Um, one of the big themes of the state plan or alternative is the concept of a credit system. It was kind of previously called a mitigation bank. Uh, at this point they're looking for funding to go out to RFP to actually have uh, a non-government organization set up kind of the parameters of what a credit system and a mitigation system would look like for sage grouse. Um, to this point, we have not uh, identified a source of funding, and I believe it's $400,000 to move that forward. Um, so at our next meeting, there may be some discussions on alternate strategies uh, as far as doing that in-house. One of the big discussions we had at the last meeting um, was the concept of, of avoidance, because what the state plan is really looking at is avoid, minimize, and mitigate. Um, and really, our only avoidance mechanism was uh, that a project developer would have to essentially say why they couldn't avoid a given area due to sage grouse concerns because of economic reasons. Um, and so we had a pretty lengthy discussion on that uh, and it was decided to ask the department to draft some mapping that essentially shows kind of where the key areas where we may want to prioritize sage grouse conservation would be. Um, I don't know that it wouldn't I don't think there's an appetite to necessarily call it an exclusion zone and exclude all uses, um, but I think there's probably some appetite for a higher level of regulation and economic disincentive to be in those areas. So I guess in a nutshell, that's kind of where we're at, and then maybe Tony can better articulate some of what the department's been asked to do and anything that maybe I missed. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jeremy. The, uh, the mapping effort, at a very minimum, it was intended to kind of provide some contextual framework for the discussion of whether or not there should be areas of exclusion, and if so, where those areas should be. Uh, looking at other states, for example, um, at, at least going through this exercise, Oregon found that they had over 90 percent of their birds were dependent on as little as 37 percent of their habitat, so they were able to designate a few areas, exclude those from development and protect a significant portion of their their population. Uh, Wyoming has a has a strategy that incorporates a threshold levels of, of disturbance of those priority areas. And so the the council had a lot of discussions, philosophical discussions um, about whether or not areas should should be excluded from from all surface occupancy um, and without the ability to really reach uh, broad consensus, the department was provided the direction to uh, develop what they what they called the golden areas, kind of the heart of the watermelon, so to speak, um, to at least frame up that that conversation. So what what we're currently uh, working on is is looking at those core areas, looking at, at areas that have high density uh, lek areas, areas that have. Uh, large contiguous chunks of high quality summer range or brood rearing areas um, and, and not the department isn't being tasked for the decision but just being tasked to help provide information that will be used in, in that decision making process. Um, 
one thing I'd like to add <coughs> as far as the, the update, I think, I think the last update, maybe the last two, um, I spoke to um, a new piece of this planning effort. It's called the Science Work Group. And currently there's, there's kind of three parts to Nevada sage grouse planning effort. There's the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council, which is uh, similar to the Wildlife Commission. There's a, a nine-member board with a diverse representation. Um, Commissioner Drew, uh, Vice Chairman Drew, sits on that, representing uh, hunting, um, hunting and conservation. Sports, sportsman rep on that, um, and that nine-member board is kind of a policy um, decision-making board. Uh, they get a lot of their ideas. Um, from the Sagebrush Ecosystem tec Technical Team, which is a five-member team uh, comprised of representatives from Department of Agriculture, Department of Division of Forestry, um, Division of State Lands, Department of Wildlife, bringing you know, state agencies together. Uh, and the third part of that, which is relatively new, is the Science Work Group. And the Science Work Group has been created to kind of um, fill some of the, the need for best available science. Um, it, We've had two meetings so far uh, over the last couple weeks. We're going to meet every two weeks. There's anywhere between 25 to 35 people involved with that, um, and it includes everything from hydrologists, geologists, fire scientists, range specialists, um, industry uh, participates. It's a it's an open meeting in the sense that. Um, anyone can attend, uh, but it isn't a decision-making board, um, so they're not agendizing items and don't necessarily have to comply with the open meeting law in that regard. Um, but they can, they can provide information and, and knowledge, have, have discussion on the threats, and provide that feedback to the technical team. We can then put it in a management-specific action and bring that before the council for, for consideration and potential incorporation into policy. I guess as a uh, last item, just kind of an update on sage grouse um, efforts and, and status, you know, sp specific to the bird. The uh, annual LEC survey data has, has been entered and analyzed, uh, shared with, with all of our partners. This year we saw a 22 percent decrease in males attending the LECs, 22 percent decrease from 2012, and it's a 34 percent decrease in the long-term average. We know that during droughts, we see a decrease in male attendance on the LEC. So there's, there's, this isn't intended to be uh, the sole metric or index of population growth or decline, um, but it isn't, it isn't good. And that same level, same type of level of decrease has, has been uh, observed westwide. And that's all, all I have. Any questions from anybody? Seeing none, we'll close that agenda item and move on to 31D wildfire update. Alan Janae. Is it on? Yes. Yep. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Alan Janae for the record. Um, just wanted to give a update on the uh, wildfire season. Um, hopefully we're at the back end of it now. <coughs> There we go. Um, so this, this shows most of the fires in the state this year. Um, I'll go through the fires that we uh, dealt with this year by region. Um, if you look at the western region, there were a total of 13 fires that consumed about 83,000 acres, um, much like the, the report that I gave you guys at the last commission meeting in Fallon. Um, Crescent Dune was the largest fire. Um, that's kind of up there in that slumbering hills country um, near Winnemucca. Uh, it was mediocre habitat, pronghorn, mule deer, chucker type habitat. Um, one of the significant resource impacts uh, or areas that were impacted was the bison fire in the bi-state uh, sage grouse area. It did consume 24,000 acres approximately. Um, again, it, it was a good fire. Um, it, it was in bi-state area, but it did consume a lot of uh, pinion juniper. Um, so it was kind of a beneficial fire. 
we actually had plans to go in there and do some some uh, management to the to the pinion juniper actually physically manipulate um, and it would have cost us money to take out much of the area that got burned so so in some some ways it was a, a rather positive fire in that area so um, we're working with BLM currently to uh, develop the ESLR plan the uh, rehabilitation plan for in there um, we've got money dedica dedicated towards uh, seed purchase in there um, but uh, we'll be implementing that as, as the fall comes along. The eastern region, uh, total of 25 fires. Uh, many of those were, were very small fires. The largest was uh, one that uh, took off, I think it was just after our last commission meeting in Fallon. Um, it was called the Red Cow Fire. <coughs> Collectively, it is a, a rather important place. It's, it's part of that Area 6 uh, sad story up there of um, just continued surgical extraction of, of remaining habitat. Uh, most of that has burned since the 80s, um, and, and it's in various uh, states of recovery, but uh, the Red Cow was another 16,000 acre impact towards that. Uh, we are working with BLM up there as well um, to design uh, rehab plans. So. In the eastern region, you can see that you know 25 fires, approximately 40,000 acres. Um, we we got off pretty good. Southern region, uh, total of six fires, largest being the Carpenter fire, which was uh, 27,800 acres. Again, high elevation stuff. Um, talking to Brad, we are trying to work with the Forest Service. Um, they have developed bear recovery plans. Um, typically those are watershed uh, restoration type of plans. Um, not nearly as active seeding as, as we sometimes uh, take on some of the other uh, managed lands. So we are working with them to see uh, what the priorities are in there and see what opportunities exist. Um, again, Carpenter Fire 20 approximately 28,000 acres of the 43,000 that was burned in the southern region. In all, 2013 so far, we've seen a total of 251,000 acres approximately burned by 44 fires. Again, these are mostly made up of the larger fires. Um, occasionally we do pick up, this comes from NDF, the information that we get, they track these fires throughout the year. Um, and so they, they pick up the majority of the fires. This might be plus or minus a few, but um, we should, provided that we don't get another uh, late season burn, um, you know, something starting in October or something like that, hopefully we'll end the year at about 260,000. So all in all, not a bad season. We actually dodged a bullet with the precip patterns that came through. So kind of positive, knock on wood, hopefully we don't get an October start or something like that. So that's about all I have on fires. Are there any questions particular? Can you go back fire? to the Western region uh, and in particular the Bison fire map? Yes. You know, we, we keep hearing about the Bison fire and, and uh, you know, total devastation of the finance and you just look at that map and you look at the size of the acreage of the surrounding area there's a whole lot of mountain there left yeah i mean it's it's a significant size fire uh, but there's a lot of acreage left in that range plus I, my understanding is what burned down there was uh heavily pinion juniper we had no sagebrush component in it it was pretty much if we could have prescribed a fire in the area, it burnt what we needed burnt. And it did what we was spent a ton of money trying to accomplish, but it did it on its own. Absolutely. Anybody else have any questions or comments? All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, tag allocation committee update. We don't have one. We didn't update anything because we didn't have a meeting last night. So that concludes E. We'll move on to 31F, wild horse update. 
Ellen Janae. So again, I tried to prepare a, a little bit of visual aid. Uh, I realized after last time, I, I felt like a talking head um, without any visuals, just reading stuff off of the paper. Um, this year, or, or since the last commission meeting, uh, the gathers that have been conducted, as you can see on the map, um, we've had five gathers conducted since the last uh, commission meeting. It has resulted in 720 horses and 83 burrows being removed from the range. Um, in the eastern region, there were two. Um, one was on the Young, uh, associated with the Young Brothers, um, kind of in the center part of the state, Little Smoky Valley type of country. Um, the other was in Fish Lake Valley um, that, uh, and I don't know why, why they got lumped into the eastern region, but anyway. Uh, Fish Lake Valley, 122 horses were removed there. Um, southern region down in the, the Seaman, uh, HMA, there were 30 horses removed. Uh, in the uh, Sheldon, they're working on extracting all of those horses off of that, um, and they did remove 415 horses and 50 burrows. Um, one key note is that Following this roundup, they were, uh, a lawsuit was filed, um, and my understanding right now is that there's a temporary restraining order uh, that was requested to try to prevent the transportation of those horses off of the Sheldon. I don't know where that stands, um, but uh, the other things in the lawsuit that, that were filed was that uh, they they made the statement that the Sheldon failed to follow policy to protect the horses um, from entering the uh, slaughter pipeline. So that was part of their lawsuit. And then the other was the violation of the First Amendment as far as not providing access to the uh, Roundup. So don't know where that'll go, but um, they're, they're definitely trying to get rid of those horses off of the Sheldon. And uh, they still have on the books for next year to remove the remaining complement of horses from their their refuge. So, um, other things that occurred this year were 203 horses off of the Blue Wing, um, kind of over near Lovelock. Um, so, so they they did get some gathers done, despite you know everybody's uh, comments of no funding for wild horse uh, gathers. So, most of them were relative to, you know, water deficiencies, threats to the horses. Uh, proposed gathers that they're evaluating at this time, there are two in the, uh, well, total of five that are out there. Um, one is in the Gold Mountain country, kind of down in here. And then up in Elko, they're looking at continuing with the Triple B Maverick Medicine Antelope uh, water bait trap. They did uh, NEPA on that for, it, it basically gave them a five, five year window to, to uh, conduct those, those gathers. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the Sheldon, uh, there was, uh, they're, they're gonna try to finish that up next year. The uh, Humboldt herd management area here by Lovelock, um, they're looking at trying to remove all the horses in that unit. Um, I, I believe that there's uh, no zero uh, management level on that, so uh, they're gonna continue on that. There's also two others that didn't show up on this map that are the Buckhorn and Copper Smith that are out of the uh, Carson City BLM district, and they're looking to remove 138 and then treat 96 mares uh, for fertility control. So. That's kind of something that we'll probably see develop throughout the winter and they'll probably uh, might have some action on it by next year. Any questions? Yes. Commissioner Did McGrath. the uh, Nevada Association of Counties uh, file their lawsuit? I, I have not heard. I don't believe it's been filed yet. <coughs> uh, any indication that it's, because uh, I think uh, I believe it's still forthcoming. They had originally intended to file it on the 7th of September and the date came and went. So uh, 
that's all all we know is that it's still anticipated Chairman, if I might just just to kind of put the whole uh, horse situation, um, give it a little context. Um, there's currently 21,000 horses, free ranging horses in Nevada. The total sum of horses, if you went across all of the horse management areas and summed the determined appropriate management level, would be around 12,000. So it's we're currently about 9,000 animals above the appropriate management level. Uh, the gathers that are occurring and scheduled to occur, the, the gather on uh, Sheldon, for example, isn't part of that 21,000 because those aren't on federal land. Those are with those are Fish and Wildlife Service horses on, on a refuge. So of that 9,000 or so animals that are above appropriate management level, uh, the BLM has indicated to us they would be able to gather possibly as many as 2,000 uh, this year and those would all be emergency gathers and wouldn't uh, begin to wouldn't would not exceed recruitment for this year so the anticipation is that we'll be above 9,000 above AML next year and and that's using their numbers and their counts right and that's that's what the BLM is telling us and if Endow went out and counted wild horses we would probably come up with another count because we know sightability and there's variables that they only put down on paper exactly what they see they don't have any type of formula for what they miss that's my understanding so that number that has just been given is still well underestimated what is totally <coughs> out there on the landscape it's certainly been a point of scrutiny and there's been a, a great deal of discussion about the BLM having a, uh, a, a more widely accepted and vetted process of their uh, modeling or censusing protocols, but I don't know where those are, but I've seen that uh, in a number of letters um, that have expressed concern over their population levels, but we get some of those too. Anybody else have any questions, comments? Okay, Mr. Bliss. I was just curious if you had any information <coughs> on uh, the potential gathers of the horses in the Cortez range. Um, where's that? Where's that? I know no one's taken claim to those horses, but that country is devastated. Yeah, um, our biologist Mike Podborny has been documenting that. We have been pushing that forward to the Elko District. Um, as you say, it's it's not much action there. Um, it's kind of one of those situations. I think they're uh, reluctant to enter into it based on past actions in the valley. So, but it is the the, the herd's huge. Um, Mike documents it every time he flies it. So, at least we have the information to push along. Anybody else? Seeing none, we'll move on to 31G litigation report. David Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, copy of the litigation report is in your packet. I'm happy to answer any questions. Anybody have anything pressing they want to ask about the litigation report? Uh, the um, <coughs> At the last meeting, there was some discussion about the Pyramid Lake uh, decision and what the impacts would be. Did we ever um, follow up on that to find out, did the department follow up on that to find out what, uh, what the options are? What was the issue? Um, the, the decision uh, basically um, I think, the it's water. I think it's number six in the Carson litigation Lake report. Yeah, water. it's the U.S. versus state engineer dealing yeah. with the Carson Lake pasture change application. Yeah, I know we, we had some discussion on that, and I believe our, uh, I think the question that came out of that meeting was what quantity of water and what impact would that have on overall operations? Would it be significant? Um, and 
at this point, my recollection is that it was a relatively small, small quantity of water. Uh, oh, feet on the water. Yeah, Alan can address this. For the record, Alan Janae. So, yeah, what it was was um, we didn't get back. Uh, there's basically a point. 51 CFS uh, or uh, acre feet, excuse me. Um, that if you are not, uh, if your crop is not or, or your use is not cultivated land, um, if your irrigation is not for, for cultivated fields, there's basically a 0 0.51 CFS uh, surcharge per se to, to your water right. Um, so all other uses along that system that aren't irrigated crop have to basically surrender 0.5 CF1 CFS um, for basically uh, maintaining water in the system. They consider it, I guess, uh, that there's no flow back, you know, drain back off of the use of that water, but that was part of the decree. So um, we still have the water rights. They're still there. It just, we didn't get the full 3.5 CFS. Uh, our water rights that we bought will now be 2.99 acre feet. And that's very common when you change manner of use away from agriculture. When I worked at Trucking Mills Water Authority in Sierra Pacific Power, I'd buy an acre foot of water and it was not an acre foot that we could use for construction purposes. We would have a reduced duty depending on where in the valley we used it. If we took it up to stead, we took a big hit because if you flush your toilet, it didn't make it back to the Truckee River type thing. So there, it's very common to have a reduced duty and change the manner of use away from agriculture. So it's nothing out of the norm. And we didn't lose the water right, we just didn't get full duty at face value of that water right, which is common. Okay, any, anything else on litigation report? I can give you one other update. Uh, the Gutierrez matter that's listed in there has actually progressed a little further than what's in the litigation report. There, we're actually, we've exchanged settlement proposals. <coughs> I expect that matter to settle, um, let's see, almost October, I, by the end of the year at the latest. I'd actually expect it earlier than that if I could get the opposing attorney to call me back, but. Okay. All right, anything else on litigation? We'll move on to department activity report. Director uh, Wasley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple, uh, couple little highlights. Um, the bear discussions continue. Um, I, I believe that we've we've been able to identify um, some unifying thoughts and ideas with respect to addressing the nuisance bear issues. Um, Commissioner McNitch spoke a little bit about uh, the IVGID uh, board meeting on, on Wednesday night. Um, we're engaged in that process and continue to uh, provide input and, and work with uh, those up there in that local community. Um, kind of an interesting side note on bears, we did uh, document some uh, black, bear, uh, black bear damage in a domestic sheep camp up in the bull runs uh, recently. Uh, don't know where that bear may have come from, where it may have been, may w maybe where it went, um, but still kind of interesting. Um, we recently received uh, $150,000 for wildfire rehab efforts from the uh, Dream Tag um, proceeds, and that'll be matched with an additional 250000 from Q1 to assist the assist the agency on our wildfire rehab efforts. Um, we've had a, a couple of uh, key personnel issues. We, we lost a couple key people in our uh, fiscal services division um, and interviews have been conducted and uh, individuals have been selected. I don't know um, what, their, what their dates or if they've accepted uh, those offers or what their starting dates might be, but that'll fill a couple key holes, one um, responsible for contracting and one with the general oversight of the, the fiscal services. Uh, we also uh, 
hired a new mule deer specialist. Um, we had great interest in that job from all over the all over the world. Actually, um, several extremely um, well qualified and well experienced uh, individuals applied for that. Um, we hired uh, Cody Schroeder. Uh, He's worked for us as a conservation aide, but he's done deer work in at least three states, including Colorado, well, four, Colorado, Idaho, California, um, and has worked with other, other species as well. So uh, he's, he started. Um, it'll be nice to, to have him on staff. We have a whole host of uh, disease issues affecting bighorn sheep in the south. We heard a little bit about that. Um, from from Mike, um, we've been part of a large uh, sampling effort where we've requested some some grant monies through the Wild Sheep Foundation to do a uh, survey and sampling effort around the southern part of the state to try to assess the extent of it, identify some pathogens so we can be more effective in addressing it. Um, perhaps we can bring the commission up, up to speed in December with that issue. We should know more at that time. And then um, I'd also like to kind of address our, our central improvement project on our Valley Road office. We moved the majority of our staff out of the Valley Road office in January with the understanding that it would probably be a four to six month period. Well, we're, we're still uh, not back in there and that's not uh, necessarily uh, due to anything the Department of Wildlife has done. It's, it's certainly uh, a perhaps a government issue, but uh, fortunately nothing that the uh, Department of Wildlife could have could have remedied. Um, we're hopeful that we'll be back in there in November. Um, that central improvement project included asbestos abatement, uh, up upgrades that um, were required um, by, by code. We now have a fire sprinkler system in there. We've got uh, asbestos tiles removed uh, and a couple other uh, maybe more cosmetic, minor, minor cosmetic uh, issues. The delays associated with that central improvement project have delayed our ability to address the video conferencing. We knew that the video conferencing equipment would be dependent on the completion of that central or that capital improvement project. Uh, we've been working with two contractors. Those contractors have, have been out, seen what we have. They've taken some measurements. They've discussed some ideas, presented us with some plans. Um, ultimately, due to current office configuration, limitations of, of space, um, they are unable to get in there and install that equipment. Um, but we have repeatedly through these updates and these efforts stated that uh, we plan to have something in place at the end of December 2013 um, and we believe we're still on task for that uh, given the communications uh, that we're having with those contractors. Um, I think that's that's all I have. Any, any questions? I'd be happy to try to answer. Commissioner them. Lane. Uh, Director, our my understanding is that you're talking about video conferencing, for example, on the commission meetings. It would only be in Elko and Reno, is that correct? And if we were not in either Las Vegas, Elko, or Reno, uh, we wouldn't be, I mean, um, Fallon, I guess, right? Is that we wouldn't be, um, we wouldn't be video conference for the meetings? Um, I, I think that's probably a, a fair statement. I think there's a lot of details like that that'll be um, have to be evaluated based on the exact system we get, its compatibility with other existing systems and the associated costs. Um, you know, it'd be our desire to have maximum flexibility, um, but I don't think um, the challenges of having a mobile system and being able to effectively, you know, set a mobile system up as you move around the state um, are, are significant. Um, hopefully we can tie into other existing systems and um, it's, I'm speaking to an area that's well out of my area of expertise. So um, hopefully when we uh, engage more fully with our potential contractors, um, you know, we can report back to the commission on it and figure some of those details out. Commissioner McBeth. 
Um, <clears throat> with regard to the disease, disease events, has any thought been given? I, I think in the past, um, hunters have collected samples. Is there any, are we doing that this year? As, you know, like for the blacks and the muddies and, uh, and the El Dorado's blueberries and, and in any of these areas that are uh, like adjacent to the rivers uh, uh, and even maybe the Spring Mountains now uh, is to determine and assess whether this is uh, a bigger problem? I don't know. I don't know that we are. I think that um, that should certainly be part of our strategy if, if Perry thinks that there's data there that can help answer those questions. Um, and some of the bacteria, like the, the mycoplasma, for example, can still be isolated, um, you know, months months afterward. And once that animal would would be caped out, um, those bacteria can be isolated from the ethmo turbinals and in, in the snout and stuff. So there would be at least some value even well after the harvest. But um, I don't know the answer to that. Any other questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to agenda item number 32, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Midwinter Annual Conference. Uh, we have an annual conference coming up in Corpus Christi, Texas, January 2nd through the 5th. And with the uh, regular meeting in San Antonio, Texas, July 17th through 23rd. Uh, this is an action item and uh, I know Commissioner McNinch has represented us very well at WAFA and always brought back information we can use. And uh, I know Commissioner Drew went to the last one in Nebraska and I see a benefit to keeping the same people going. I'd like to involve everybody in that WAFA, but uh, if you keep rotating people, I don't think you get the long-term benefits by a rotation of people. Uh, so if those two are agreeable, that would be my suggestion at this point that they would be the two if their calendars are allow it and they are agreeable to going. I would like to see those two continue to go to WAFA. And any other discussion on that? Okay. It was listed as an action item, so I got to take it to public comment. Is there any public comment on commissioners going to WAFA? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission. I don't know. Well, our, our next meeting's not till December, and it'd be kind of late to take any action to say you two are going in December. Uh, Maybe we can just say if you if you check your calendars and you are available, you can go. And we've always, we've budgeted for two going, or do we budget for one going the winter and two going the summer? Can you remember, Director Walsh? Uh, I don't know. Um, I can't, can't answer that. That sounds, that sounds right, but I don't know. Into. We'll, we'll look into it, but uh, is there any questions from the commission on sending those two to WAFA? It is an action item, but I don't know if we need to take an action. I believe we can just make it work if it works with their schedules. All right. No more comment on that one. We'll move on to agenda item 33, future commission meetings and committee assignments. Of future commission meeting director Wasley so we uh, we will meet again December 6th and 7th in Reno uh, the main main issues are policy regulations and, and program reports a few of the uh, few of the items that have been discussed the last couple of days that I've taken some notes on that we'll be sure and have on that agenda include the uh, an update on the Incline Village General Improvement District uh, board meeting and associated bear management strategies. Um, I believe the department has been um, tasked with uh, some revisions on the trail cam reg to bring back before the commission at that meeting. Um, 
I think that uh, we'll be further along with some of the development on the some of the cow elk management, some of our harvest strategies there. We can provide an update on that. Um, the predator control project status reports for FY13. <coughs> Uh, policy 23 will also a clean version of policy 23 will also be provided and, and brought back before the commission for possible action uh, we can provide an update on the um, sheep disease survey and sampling effort uh, and also uh, whether or not uh, at that point, there still may be some opportunity to involve hunters that haven't been successful uh, at that time, but I'll give you an update on, on that as well. Um, and then uh, I guess depending on what comes out of this evening's committee meeting, there may be some other items associated <coughs> with potentially uh, visitation or um, some of that related information and that's that's all I have on on my list currently okay just clarification on the elk to get so we can apply for a bull and a cow we need to make some NAC change so we can start going forward on the NAC change to so we can get some of that stuff implemented for this coming draw process Maureen Hollinger Department of Wildlife um, I do have drafted language pending what was going to come out of the meetings today so I've got stuff already drafted um, and we'll hopefully um, get that submitted to LCB now that I have an idea of out of this meeting, dis out of discussion, further okay. information. All right. So with that timing a bit going to LCB, we'll be able to have it heard in this coming year and hopefully implement it in the upcoming draw process? That's what I'd like to see, yes. With okay. December, I'm hoping to make it. Okay. All right. And then the other thing that I had on my list of things that we were after was uh, looking at lifting regulations on that uh, uh, trophy section on the Truckee River. Did, did you want to do that through a potential petition process? I would rather not do the petition process because I think the department says it's not meeting its objective. And if it's not meeting its objective, why would we, if we run it through the petition process, we have to bring it here. Here's a petition, accept a petition, and then start going forward. It slows down a good idea to run it through the petition process. So if we're already to the point that we've agreed that it would be a good idea of going forward, let's not, it just wastes our time and I just as soon get this kind of stuff done. I mean, if Washoe County has heartburn with it, when we put it in front of them, it's in their county, and we can backtrack at that point and not accept it. But uh, let's let's get it going and see where it falls when it goes in front of their calves. <coughs> Commissioner Wallace. I'm not sure if I heard it, but the elk damage and incentive committee, we need a placeholder there for uh, at least a committee report, and uh, hopefully we'll be bringing forward that landowner program. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Commissioner Lane. Uh, Mr. Chairman, are we going to talk about this, the merit issue that was discussed this morning as a part of the trapping committee, or is that going to be a separate item uh, on the agenda? I would like to run that through the trapping committee. We can't speak to that today at the trapping committee later today because I don't believe we're agendized in a proper fashion to address that issue, but we can agendize it later and run it through the trapping committee. Uh, we have a host of trapping issues that we may need to look into as a result of what we're trying to get to. And instead of spending four hours doing it here, I'd rather run it through the trapping committee, get it right before we bring it to this body so we can go forward with it. One way or another, you're in the meeting. <laughs> Anybody else? This is a uh, action item. Uh, any public comment on what we've just gone over for future commission meetings? Seeing none, we'll close that agenda item and uh, move on to our last item, 34, public comment. Mr. Moldy.
Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Don Moldy Reno, actually representing No Bear Hunt Nevada, <clears throat> appreciates the efforts you're doing on uh, trying to get the uh, bear proof container thing moving. Uh, that's greatly appreciated. Uh, I do need to offer an apology to the department because it's what I'm about to mention is probably more uh, something that I <coughs> should have brought to the department's attention and will, but just didn't uh, notice it until recently, uh, but I couldn't resist mentioning it here today. When I was looking on the website a couple of days ago under publications, the very lead off publication at the top of the list, which was sort of under the educational portion, uh, was something called Fur Bear Management in Nevada. I'd never seen this before, <coughs> and I looked at it, printed it off. Um, it sits there as though it's policy to somebody who may not understand how the system works and uh, might come upon it accidentally. It's undated. Uh, there's no authorship attributed to this. Um, although some of the items in the bibliography reference uh, documents published in 2012. So I'm assuming that this is a recent um, addition to the publications list. Um, it, uh, the most charitable way I could describe it is that um, it's sort of like a college student's effort to justify trapping uh, after having had a couple of wildlife management classes but knowing nothing about trapping and given the class project to come up with a defense of trapping. That's sort of the best way I can describe in, a, in the most charitable way what this looks like. It's grossly naive. Uh, there uh, huge um, issues are left unaddressed. Uh, for example, it implies <coughs> in the very first section that the Department of Wildlife manages fur bearers. And we all know you don't. The only thing you do is set season limits. There are no quotas, uh, there are no objectives, goals, nothing that would comprise the management program for fur bearers that I know of uh, that goes on in this department. Fur bearers are described in here as somewhat unique animals that need to be killed just by, I, I'm paraphrasing, uh, just by virtue of their nature you have to kill them, uh, which is a bizarre uh, view in my view. Beavers are trashed in here which uh, offends me greatly. Um, <laughs> there's no mention, uh, oh, and then a number of pro-trapping groups are quoted as justification for trapping without any uh, reference to agency or to other organizations that oppose it. There's no mention in here, for example, that <clears throat> we have a number of states in this country that uh, have eliminated trapping by legislation, and that perhaps 100 countries or so in the world do not allow trapping. So somehow the world gets along without trapping in various locations. Uh, I was struck by one, though. I, I always learn something. Uh, there's a sentence in here under the importance of trapping and fur bear management strategies. And I read the sentence. Trappers function as endows unpaid technicians in the implementation of structured management strategies. I have been dying to get my hands on the copy of those structured management strategies. I cannot find those things anywhere. And if anybody knows where I could get my hands on structured management strategies, where Endow sends out Nevada's trappers, Mother Nature's little helpers, to go out and kill certain animals that you've decided are pests and uh, ought to be eliminated, I would love to get my hands on that. Because somebody please, well, I don't want to drip any more sarcasm on this. The point is that you're a public agency, you're a state agency, I'm as much a constituent of your agency as any trapper that sits in this room. And it seems to me that as a state agency, the agency has at least the obligation to be fair when they're describing a controversial wildlife issue like trapping. And I, I, do not, I, I don't want to sound condemning in what I'm saying because this is brand new and the, and the department really doesn't even know about this as far as I know. I'm just, this is kind of a new thing. And so I'm just simply, having a little fun with this, uh, to suggest that maybe there should be a counterpoint to this. I'd be happy to write one. Or perhaps the department, just as a training exercise, would send the person who wrote this to write the other side of the issue. That would probably be an excellent educational endeavor for whoever did it. Uh, and I would be happy to help that person if they wanted some free assistance from another Mother's Nature little helper, uh, Mother's Nature little helper, which is me. Anyway, um, I just wanted to bring that to your attention and have a little fun with it.
Thank you. Rex? County. Um, as you know, in this last legislature, uh, we had to start putting on a public representative. Um, Washoe County has met that this year with the reappointment of John Reed. Uh, he requested to be uh, uh, put on as a public member, and the uh, Washoe County Commission accepted that. Uh, uh, he was supported in that endeavor by the Humane Society and I believe the Sierra Club. Um, and there was one other group involved. So we just thought you should know that. Thank you very much. Anybody else with public comment? Stephanie? Stephanie and then Joel. Stephanie Myers, Lee Canyon. I think, uh, I apologize, I think I missed something about the video conferencing because, you know, when you guys meet up north, and most of the people are in the south. It's like there's no sunshine there. And I, I guess I missed when it is we're actually going to get video conferencing. I believe what uh, Director Wosley said was we will, it's in con connection with the uh, building project. You can help me out here, Tony. Late December. So maybe not in time for the next uh, commission meeting, but around that time, depending on how the building comes. Joel? For the record, Joel Blakesley, Nevada Trappers Association. Just want to make some comments about what uh, Dr. Moldy just said. Once again, history repeats itself. He and I have been doing this since 1977 or thereabouts. Um, the wildcat management in Nevada is probably the best there is in the entire world. I know what goes on in other states. We have a tremendous program here. We've got a tremendous database. I mean, it's, it's exemplary. That paper he referenced is, is a good one. He mentions quotas. We talked about that ad nauseum from 1977 till about 1983, and Congress actually made an act of Congress that we don't have to do quotas. That was something in the Bobcat Wars of the 70s. So I just wanted to add a little history because every time we get a new commission on, we have to talk about what happened 30, 40 years ago. And I guess at this point, I'm the historian. So just understand that they're going to try you again, and I'm going to be here to present the other side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Public comment? Seeing none, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Okay. All right, we're done. We'll be back. I believe the meeting starts at 6.